Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Did you know that the Aggie Merge podcast is just three episodes away from our 100th episode? We really value our listeners, and we're excited to celebrate that 100th episode with Gabe Brown, or as we like to call him, the guy who shifted Monty's paradigm. We're looking forward to a great conversation with Gabe that will air on January 3rd. And if you'd like to submit a question that you've got for Gabe or Monty, click on the link in the show notes and send them our way. And all this nostalgia has us focusing on why we do what we do. On today's show, we're sharing Monty's vision and mission and why our team at Ag Solutions Network and Ag Emerge are so focused on bringing you information and conversations that push all the buttons including pushing a few of yours. We don't shy away from the difficult discussions and we constantly challenge the status quo to seek new life and new civilizations, to boldly go, oh wait, that's the Star Trek mission, not ours. But seriously, we believe in the direction regenerative agriculture, or whatever you're calling it today, is going and how it leads to a path of raising healthy crops healthy livestock, healthy people living on a healthy planet. And we'd like to help you get there too. So take a listen as Monty dives in to the hard questions of why and how we can help you along your regenerative journey. Why? Is there a more powerful word? It only has three letters, but it opens a world of possibilities when you ask it. You know, kids ask it a lot, why this, why that, because, because, because. It can go on and on. And kids have that innate need to know why. Have we forgotten to as adults to ask why? And I encourage you to really consider that powerful word in everything that you do. Always be asking yourself, why? Someone that I follow a lot is Simon Sinek, and he's done a great job of outlining many things that we need to consider our motivations and why we do what we do. And in his quote here, he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. You know, Martin Luther King gave the I have a dream speech, not a I have a plan speech. And there's a significant difference. When you understand your why, all, everything else aligns up. And it's, it's so important to start with why and question what you're doing today in order to discover what you need to do tomorrow. So think about why do you do what you do today as a, as a farmer? I'm sure many of you do it because of your family. You're motivated to be successful and, and, and make an income and and support and coach and mentor your family and watch them grow and and develop their own lives. Many of you do it because you want to have an abundant lifestyle. You want to have experiences that you don't have from just doing everyday things. You want to have better. You want to enjoy all that God has provided for us. And others of you do it for achievement, you know, being able to farm more land, have nicer equipment, be recognized as a farmer leader, to really understand and be an influencer in your community. All of these are are great goals of why we do what we do. And there's many, many other things that motivate people to do what they do. But I wanna ask you a little deeper question. Why do you farm the way that you do? What influences you? Is it friends and family, community members at the church or or various clubs that you're in a peer group and there's peer pressure to keep doing what you're doing because you know what, I I really don't want to stand out because you don't want to be that guy. 
do they have your best interests in mind? Maybe you're stuck with the equipment and the assets that you have when you've got millions of dollars in equipment to do things the way that you've always done, it's very tough to make a switch to a different crop, a different production methodology, because you have those costs built in to what you're currently doing. Or my favorite, maybe it's the alphabet soup of government programs. That's causing you to farm the way that you do. You're trying to meet all of the compliance issues trying to take advantage of all the extra revenue income opportunities associated with farming for our government. It's a mess. We spend a ton of time figuring out, are we in compliance? Did we maximize the benefit of crop insurances? Did we maximize the benefit of the latest trade war payout? It's nuts how much time we spend to just satisfy and or maximize the opportunity given to us through the Farm Service Agency. And then there's other agencies too where we're dealing with groundwater pumping and surface water rights and air pollution. It's just an alphabet soup of craziness that we have to deal with. But is that driving our decisions and why we farm the way we do? I think it does. Ask yourself this. What if you started with a soil health first approach. Instead of worrying about the peers and what you're doing and always done and worrying about what the government tells you to do, what if you just started with the basics of this is what the soil is telling me to do? What would it look like on your farm? What if you eliminated glyphosate on your farm, neonicotinoids, and eliminated GMOs? Do you really think the public wants us using those things? I think they've spoken rather loud. So why are we doing it? What if we learn to farm without these tools and farm in a way that is better aligned with soil health? What if I brought livestock back to the land? Wow, that's crazy. I spent my entire childhood tearing out fences and tearing down barns, taking out water lines because, it, we're gonna farm crops. And that's what crop farmers do. But what if I considered doing the opposite and bringing livestock back to the land? Just because I've made a mistake in the past doesn't mean I need to keep making that mistake in the future. What if I connected closer to the people buying food? Rather than bringing a grain crop into the terminal or the ethanol plant or to the rail siding, what if I grew food-based crops? that went to a mill to feed somebody, or I grew specialty crops that have more of a direct link to the consumer, or what if I did a little bit of specialty grains and ancient grains and sold directly online on a website? What if I did pastured proteins and sold them directly to consumers? What would that be like? You see, I believe farmers will do the right thing. That's how we're wired. We are wired to do the right thing. It's just innate in our nature. But we have to know the right thing to do. We have to know that truth in order to do the right thing. How do I know about these questions? I've asked them of myself. And every one of those questions I've answered because I've come to learn things at Ag Emerge that called into question what I was doing. So I had two opportunities as a result of that. Ignore it, go on my merry way, and get involved in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of just making things happen, or I could do it right, put forward extra effort and get to a new production paradigm, which I'm in the process of doing, and I'll always be in the process of doing, just like you are. Your operation is not static. You don't do the same thing every year. It's always changing. But are we changing for the good? This is a quote that I really enjoy, and it talks about truth. It passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, is accepted as self-evident. Like, whoa, 
that just seems crazy. First off, it's made fun of, and then it's, you know, censored or violently opposed, and, you know, made people are made fun of and attacked because of it. And then the next stage is, yeah, it's always been like that. You think back several things, whether in, in culture, society, in farming, that's a pretty common pattern. And when you look at regenerative ag right now, it's in the ridiculed stage. It's like, ah, you can't do that because you can't produce enough food to feed the world. Or, ah, we don't have the, the skill to do that. Or, eh, it just isn't going to work. That's for a bunch of kind of crazies out there. We'll be coming up on the second stage pretty soon where it's violently opposed. And that will include landlords are like, no, you can't do that. It'll include um, companies not giving us the options for the tools and equipment that we need, not developing it fast enough for what we need to make this happen. It'll come in direct opposition ways from uh, herbicide or chemical companies and seed companies that want to maintain the status quo. But then after we go through that transition period, it's just what we do then, right? So it'll be really interesting to watch that regenerative path as we move forward. This is a photo from my farm. This is an original home farm. It's been in our family for 150 years. When I look out over that hill there, it's a 50 acre hill, I see all the results of good and bad decisions over the last 150 years. I can look at the bad decisions of moldboard plowing up and down that hill and the erosion and the eight foot of field dirt that's in the bottom and the denuded topsoil on the sides of those hills. I can look and see modern bad decisions of that oak tree right there where we used to spray glyphosate around the base of trees in order to not have to weed trim around them. And I'm sure others have done that too and I can see the, the limb die back there. But I also can see the good going on here. That field is green. It is ready to be planted into. The soil is holding in place with no erosion. We're pumping carbon into that soil. We're feeding the microbial life. We're doing all of the right things. In fact, we've brought cattle back to the land. At one time, my great-great-grandfather had six different species of animals and six different species of crops that he was raising on that 80 acres. We're not close to that diversity yet, but we're getting there. And those cattle are turning sunlight into fertilizer. And they're feeding the microbial community, doing things far faster than we could ever do with just no-till and cover crops alone. Now, was that easy to do? Absolutely not. It required starting from scratch in order to make it all possible. But I started with a soil health focus first approach, and I knew that's what's best for the soil, I'm going to do that. And if I do that, everything else in my operation aligns. So I start with the truth and let it come into fruition versus worry about what I'm currently doing or what everybody else thinks of me in order to make it possible for great soil health. Our farm today, we have lots of opportunities to try things and, and put soil health practices to work. In the upper left there is our planter. We're variable rate applying row by row, three different nutrient packages in five locations, along with the ability to put on two different hybrids at the same time. All computer controlled by soil type, soil texture, organic matter, and EC. We've done things where we've planted a field with two different crops based on the slope. On the sloped areas, we put in a regenerative type cover crop and grazed it. In the flatter areas, we planted soybeans. Who says you have to plant in straight rows? You can see on the upper right there where we have gone through and planted into extraordinarily heavy residue that was previously grazed and get great stands. It's not an issue. We've worked with 60 inch corn, had good success, but still trying to find the right fit. We've worked with corn and wheat, or excuse me, beans and wheat together in a corridor approach right there on our farm. We found some great results with that when well, we've had some train wrecks with it. But if we didn't have the train wrecks to learn, we wouldn't have the great results today. We also pioneered the skip strip here on the green cover. So we actually don't plant one of the rows and leave it for the 30 inch row planter to go right through and leave an undisturbed seed trench to maximize yield potential. 
And we've worked with intercropping and, and those kind of things on our farm to see if we can make cover crops grow during the cash crop. This is an example of a, a great picture of a lot of the different things we got going on simultaneously. In the background there, you can see a high clearance sprayer that is seeding cover crops into a standing corn plot, corn crop. And that corn crop is food grade corn, able to get a 75 cent premium. And then in the foreground, we can see our sheep flock. And what are they doing right here? Well, this is at our bend site and we're using the sheep to control weeds and to control grass and mow it down and, and regenerate the grass and, and weeds around our bend site. They don't bother any electrical controls at all. And they do a lot better job than us having to go around and spray stuff or run a weed eater. It's just using things that we have at our disposal to maximize their value. So I took this one step further and we're raising a great quality protein product, integrating livestock on our farm. And I thought, there's people who really want this. So we started Grateful Graze. And this is a direct to consumer company to where we connect our farm to families. And we've hosted a lot of events to educate the public on what is going on today on the farm because they're so disconnected. In the upper left hand corner, we hosted the sectional soil judging contest. Doug Pitts was able to show the kids how roots and soil interact on different slopes and with different grazing and different cover crops. It was a great time. We invite the public out to our farm just to get away from it all and be in our pasture for our annual concert with the cows. People love it. They didn't know that cows love music too. And then we invite them, they pay to come to our farm and tour and see how we move the livestock, why we plant the cover crops, how this all works and understand where their food is coming from. Then we deliver directly to their door. We give them great recipes to work with. And then we partner with other leaders such as these two medical doctors here and a chiropractor in the, uh, in the foreground. It's amazing what we're trying to do to tell that soil health story. So not only are we doing the soil health principles, we are sharing and trying to teach others about a principles first approach to agriculture. So since I get this asked, <laughs> I get asked this question a lot. It's like, why would a fertilizer company advocate regenerative ag? You've heard a lot of the speakers say, ah, oh, you don't need to put any fertilizer out there. It just all take care of itself. Well, the simple answer is regenerative agriculture is the truth. And if it's the truth, let's just say, why are we waiting out the inevitable? So we know that this is the direction it's going to go once it goes through the three phases of truth and we're gonna be there supporting you at the end. And the reality is we, we have to regenerate our soils and we have to do it now. Sustainable is just not good enough. And what we call sustainable today, it isn't sustainable. If it can't last for a thousand years doing what we're doing, it don't pass the test. We have to do much, much better. So reality, Ag Solutions Network is not a fertilizer company anyway. We really are a crop production system company. We're putting together the best of basic science and discovery research into a proven program that you can maximize on your farm. We happen to have some fertilizer products that augment the plant when it needs it most to accomplish your goals, but it's part of a system, not just peddling fertilizer. Our biologically based system has aligned with the regen movement way before it was cool. We were doing regenerative ag principles and soil health principles before they'd even come up with the name. One other thing is the reason we do this is it's farmer owned <laughs> and I'm the farmer that's leading the charge with this. A friend of mine, Will Harris, has a saying and there's only three things in this world that you cannot hide. The sun, the moon, and the truth. Eventually, you will see all three. So knowing that this is inevitable, we really look at why we're doing what we're doing. And this truth is all about abundant life. Ag Emerge was created to help you discover the truth. Ag Solutions Network exists to guide you every step of the way from where you are today to where you want to get to. Honestly, I'm not an inventor. I have lots of ideas, but they're not original ideas. 
I put different things together from different places. I'm a synthesizer. I look at good ideas and think how they could be applied somewhere else. I look at three ideas and how they could work together. That's what I do, and that's what this is all about. At the end of the day, together we're all going to create healthy soils, plants, and animals. We're going to connect food raised right with families, and we're going to rebuild communities and ecosystems, part of the unintended benefit of regenerative agriculture. Bottom line, we choose to prosper life. Four years ago, I went to visit my friend Gabe Brown at his ranch up in Bismarck, North Dakota, just to see if this was real. There's what I looked like. I took a selfie when I left. I had a headache. I was just overwhelmed. And I know how you feel right now. But I knew I had to do it. Because, again, if you teach a farmer the right thing to do, he or she will do it. So I'm counting on you to move regenerative agriculture forward. And we're going to be here to help you do it. So let's do better, farm better, be better, together. We're taking a short break to share that the Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by the team at Ag Solutions Network. We're looking forward to celebrating January 3rd, 2023, when the 100th episode of the Ag Emerge podcast will air with none other than soil health leader, Gabe Brown. Do you have questions for Gabe? Send us a note at contactus at agemerge.com before November 30th, and Monty will ask Gabe your questions during his extended deep dive conversation. Rooted in innovation, ASN is committed to leaving the land better than we found it, not simply maintaining it. We're here to help you navigate the balancing act of productivity and building a legacy. From practices to products, ASN is more than a new jug. It's a new way of thinking. So don't be afraid to be different. Be afraid to be the same. Contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. And now, back to our show. Now it's time to scale up regenerative agriculture. Step one is we have to begin with the soil health principles. There will be a quiz someday when I see you face to face to make sure you've got these memorized. We're going to first start with armor on the soil. That means protecting it from wind, water, and sunlight erosion. By sunlight, I mean those UV rays nuking the microbes and burning up carbon out of the soil. We want that covered all the time, whether it's with green or decaying residues. Part two is we want to minimize that soil disturbance and of course that means tillage. We want you to get to no-till or strip-till as fast as possible to minimize that bulk soil disturbance and especially that surface soil disturbance with implements such as worm burners or excuse me you don't call them worm burners I do vertical tillage machines. We also want to look at minimizing the input of conventional fertilizers and minimizing the input of herbicides, insecticides, and pesticides. Really, we want to minimize disturbance means don't do so much stuff to your field. Next, we want to focus on plant diversity. A great way to do that is with cover crops and high diversity mixtures of the warm and cool seasons and also the four basic types of cover crops. Get them out there. Get some variance in your field. Mix up the microbial community. Stimulate organisms that haven't been alive and working for many years. Also, let's change up the crops. Let's do something different instead of the same rotation all the time. You should make, as Dwayne Beck says, your crop rotation so confusing to weeds and pests that even you're confused. We also want to have a continual living root and plant at all times. Anytime that soil temperature is at 32 or above, we want to plant pumping carbon and nutrients, mineralizing nutrients from the soil, and pumping that carbon in to make all of the magic happen that needs to happen in the soil microbiome. And finally, as some of my friends like to jokingly call it, the fifth element, principle five, integrating livestock. Really, the first four things do some amazing things, and they'll get, you a lot, they'll get you a long way down the road. But the fifth element doubles that effort, and we really want to help you get there and improve your soil health as rapidly as possible. So the key is, and we say this a lot here and on the podcast, the principles are universal, but the practices are local. So we have to adopt these principles into your local practices to make it work, and that's what we're here for. 
you need to select a trusted advisor to help you along this way. Ag Solutions Network members are local soil health experts. They're CCAs and they're PCAs. And they're here with a systems approach to help you meet your soil health goals. They're going to ask you questions and develop a long-term plan for your farm. They're going to provide you with outstanding products and strategies to make everything work together. And they're going to have their shadow and their shovel in your field on a weekly basis. Because if you don't monitor and manage what you're doing, you're not going to know how to improve even more in the future. At the end of the year, they're going to analyze results and adapt to meet to your specific goals for your farm and family. And that's part of that process of systems thinking, evaluating what you've done, and making it better for next year. And one thing that's really key to remember, your ASN member is invested in your results. Because if you don't get results, you don't work with them again. So they have a financial interest in what you're doing. They need your results to be great so that you continue to work with them year after year. And I do want to bring up and warn you just a little bit, there's a ton of information on Facebook, YouTube, and other contemporary methods of communication. They're good for information, but honestly, where is their accountability? If it don't work, what are you going to do? Not watch their video again? ASN team members have that investment in you, and they really want your local success to be as great as it can be. So if you're new to ASN and you wonder, how do we get started? What do we do? Where do we go from here? How do we scale up regenerative agriculture? I want you to select about 25% of your acres. Yeah, that's a lot. But it's enough to really see what's going on in different soil conditions, different crops, and, and get a good feel for things. Plus, it's also enough that you're invested to want to make it work. If you don't do enough, it's just kind of that, yeah, that thing I'm doing over there. We want it to be a plan on how you're going to move forward in the future to make this your standard practice and make conventional somebody else's practice. So then once you've selected those fields, step one is we got to really pay attention to what we're doing at harvest. Tillage used to reset everything to zero and you could do anything you wanted to at harvest and screw it all up. You can't do that anymore. You have to pay attention to the silage chopper getting in there when there's water standing on the ground. You got to pay attention to your irrigation ahead of that, right? You have to pay attention to the trucks driving anywhere and everywhere in the field when they harvest or the grain carts and heavy trafficking. You have to pay attention on tomato harvesters. How are they doing in the field? Are they chopping up the residue and evenly distributing it? Or do you have big wads of vines everywhere? Okay, how are the almond harvesters doing? Are they completely messing up the level of your floor? Have to really pay attention. That harvest pass sets the stage for everything in the next year. Step two, we are gonna eliminate or minimize tillage. No-till has been done successfully worldwide in every crop. We want you to take advantage of that. And in fact, if you can't quite do it in a no-till environment, strip-till is a great bridge to get to no-till. But don't get caught in the trap of strip-till being the destination because you can do better than that. Step three, overcome nutrient cycle changes with the power to grow system. We want you to reduce those conventional nutrient applications, but we also want to change the timing of those conventional applications and augment them with our biologically based power to grow approach. Where we're telling that plant what to do at specific times, because rather than waiting around for three years like some of our speakers have mentioned, we want you to have success year one. And that's one of the major motivators behind the power to grow system. It'll help you make that transition from full tillage to minimum or no tillage and make it cost effectively with success year one. The fourth step, we're gonna be adding high diversity cover crops to your operation. Reason for it is, is we want a more robust soil microflora. We want, it, we want things to be more diverse and create a more 
disease-tolerant crop in your field. There's some amazing things that cover crops do, and we'll provide not only the seed and the selection, the expertise, and deliver it right to your farm. Many of our members have access and rent out no-till drills to allow you to be able to put it in an almond orchard on a dairy or you know, in a dry land scenario. They will help you make this happen. And step five, we'll talk about it now, but we're not going to go there just yet because you're getting started. Be thinking in the back of your mind of integrating livestock, maybe in year three or five. What does that look like? How do I get ready for that? That's just one to put in the back of the head for now. All right, now it's time for me to talk to our long-term customers. It's time to keep going. Some of you have plateaued, okay? Don't plateau now. You understand the power to grow system. You've seen it work. You understand the yield and quality benefits, but you're in a routine. You've gotten comfortable. I need you to move forward and challenge yourself to the next level. You need to be doing high diversity cover crops everywhere, every year, no exceptions. Let's take the next step. You need to push to lower conventional inputs. Get off of the fertilizer drug. Dial it back. Let your soil work for you. Be bold. Let's get to much less conventional fertilizer inputs. And it's time for the fifth element for you. We need to work with neighbors or other people. We've got a list of people who would love to be able to custom graze. They're all over. They're looking for those opportunities. Let's partner up if you don't want to be in the livestock business. But the most important is let's get a four-legged ruminant on your ground as soon as possible. And the other thing is continue to develop premium specialty crop and direct marketing opportunities. Many of you are taking advantage of those things now, but honestly, the nutrient density, because you've been working with us on the Power to Grow program, and the quality of the product that you're creating you are not receiving a full value for. So let's work together, think together how we can make you receive that full value. Because I just hate to see all that great nutrition being mixed in with everybody else's mediocre. Let's make it happen. I want to talk a little bit about fear and how strong of a motivator it is. Fear has run amok, okay? We've been hit by a lot. Water rights and availability are being tested everywhere. Everywhere we have challenges and issues. It's a constant fight for what was a long-term promise being taken away. Trade wars. Endless trade wars have really affected our almond farmers and they've affected commodity farmers greatly. And we would rather be able to sell our crops to people who want to buy them without having to get a CFAP check to cover the difference. Labor costs, skill, availability, all a huge challenge and will continue to be a challenge. And it just puts a lot of fear and anxiety into us of what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You know, environmental and business regulations and this year, weather extremes, fires, floods, droughts, you name it, we had it. There's a lot that we can have anxiety and fear about. But of all those that I just listed, guess what you can do about it? Nothing. They're out of your control. You can work with political action committees and those kind of things, but your direct control, you don't have it. So we need to focus on what we do have control over. So rather than fear these externals, I want you to change that fear to internal. Instead of fear of doing something different, which everybody has, admit it, I do too. I want you to fear doing the same. Realizing that your parents, grandparents, if we were still doing it the same, we'd have horses, okay? I want you to fear doing the same thing you've done the year before and the year before that. What if you could reduce your conventional fertilizer inputs by 50%? What if you could get premiums for your crops what if you could have higher yields and quality? What if you could reduce water applied or in a dry land environment be less drought sensitive? What if your plants were more resistant to pests and diseases? 
all of this is not a matter of what if. The people who we are working with today will tell you this is happening. And we're excited to help more people enjoy the benefits of great soil health, great nutrition management as part of an entire crop production system. But what happens if you don't fear the same? You'll keep doing what you've always done, getting the same or worse results than what you would expect. So we're here to help you take it to the next level. So I want you to think and just visualize in your, in your head right now. If you're an almond farmer, when the almonds bloom, the bees are working, it's sunny out, it's warming up, you can hear, you can smell the scents of the blooms, you can see the green on the floor, the bees are working as you walk through the orchard, they bounce off of you. They're doing their thing. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time of year. If you're a wheat grower, I want you to think about when the wheat greens up. It's been brown, it's been covered in snow and ice, and now there's that new life coming forth in the spring, and you're just itching to get going, and you know you need to put some green up, fertilizer out there and start really taking care of that crop to maximize its potential. And you just have that feel in you that it's time to go and time to do something. Or when the corn is planted, you've got 10 days of ideal planting conditions to get it all in the ground and get it in there right. And you've tinkered on that planter all winter long and it's go time and you're ready to make it happen and do everything right. At that moment, are you going to fear the same? Or are you going to reach for that ignition key and fire up that diesel engine and let it come to life? Let the hydraulics and PTO and everything that's going on there, the whine of those vacuums, that feeling that you get when it's time to make it happen. When you grab that radio, to talk to your team, what's going on, when you're communicating with them, or when you send a message to your management team that we need to get these blocks done. Are you gonna send the message that says, I'm in control and I'm going to do it the right way? We don't want you to fear the same. We want you to do the right thing. I want us to be better, do better, farm better, together. So fear the same, scale up regenerative agriculture. We can't do it. Only you can make regenerative agriculture possible, and we're counting on being there to help you do it. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed everything that Ag Emerge has to offer and we look forward to continuing to provide you the leadership and support to meet your goals. Take care. We sure hope Monty's message got you thinking about your why. Have you evaluated your goals and missions lately? We hope this conversation poked a few buttons and got you thinking about your operation and what steps you might take to move towards a better soil health system. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help folks implement soil health systems, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.